This week on Wealth Track, the big investment picture. Top rated economist Nancy Lazar and number one strategist Francois Trahan on why the US is the place to invest and China is in trouble. A Wealth Track exclusive with both is next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Luma Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. And Rosalind P. Walter. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. If there is one lesson investors have learned from the financial crisis and its aftermath, it is that macro matters. The risk on, risk off market of the financial crisis, where the vast majority of assets moved in lockstep in reaction to a monetary policy move or an economic number or political pronouncement, is seared in the collective memory of investors. As you can see from this chart provided to us by this week's guest, macro forces have historically had an oversized influence on stock returns. Over the last two decades, for instance, stock specific influences have accounted for about 28% of stock market returns on average, whereas macro forces have accounted for nearly 70%. And since the financial crisis, that influence has risen to nearly 90%. But which macro events matter the most? How much attention should you be paying to the Federal Reserve's possible tapering of its massive government bond buying program? How about the slowdown in corporate profit growth and the fastest rise in price earnings multiple since the dot-com bubble? How much influence will the surge in domestic energy and manufacturing production have on the markets? And what about the slowdown in China? Well, these are all trends being tracked by this week's guests. Two investment research stars who recently joined forces with the street's number one Washington analyst team of Andy LaPerriere and Roberto Perley to create a new institutional research firm devoted solely to macro research. And they are joining us exclusively on Wealth Track. Nancy Lazar, a founding partner of Cornerstone Macro, will lead its economic research team. Lazar has been a coveted institutional investor-ranked economist for the past 12 years, including being ranked number two for the past four. She is second only to Ed Hyman, her former business partner, with whom she co-founded independent research firm ISI Group in 1991. Francois Trahan, also a founding partner of Cornerstone Macro, is leading its investment strategy team. Trahan has been ranked the number one portfolio strategist by institutional investors for six of the past eight years and ranked number two the other two years. I began the interview by asking them about one of their major macro calls, why they are bullish on the U.S. economy and markets. There are longer term growth engines for the U.S. economy today, of which we've never really seen the likes of. We've spent 30 years uh, making our manufacturing sector more productive. And finally, I think manufacturing is indeed going to be a leader in creating jobs, not just on the high end, but for the low to middle income workers. So I'm bullish on the job outlook for the United States. In addition, simultaneously, we've found this gold mine of natural resources, energy, not only natural gas, but also now oil. And the multipliers from both manufacturing and energy are huge in that for every job you create in those industries, you create three other jobs in non-energy manufacturing related jobs. So you're building out middle America the right way. I'll say it, this is not politically acceptable, the right way, the private sector way, without the government. In fact, I think longer term, this is also going to help to reduce our budget deficit. So that will be less of a concern for those that definitely there's reason to be concerned about that. And at the same time, the energy boom, the excess labor we do have, higher unemployment we do currently have, those forces are going to help keep inflation low in the United States. And so we have a period of slow to moderate growth. Let's not get carried away. I'm not talking about rapid growth. Slow to moderate growth because we do have excesses. We are still unwinding the federal government, the consumer debt. 
uh, slow to moderate growth with a low inflationary environment, which will help keep interest rates lower than they otherwise would be. They'll still go up, but lower than they otherwise would be. So just net a very uh, uh, solid uh, economic environment, which will be good net for financial assets. So and so and this is this is a long term. These are long term structural changes that you're talking about. So when are we going to see em employment respond, or do you think it already has responded and we're just missing it? There are definitely this is a, a forecast, but there are signs that you are seeing it in particular in, in employment. I've identified 15 states that are initially the biggest beneficiaries of this new theme, from Michigan to Texas. And what you see in these 15 states is that manufacturing and energy related employment are indeed more strong than they are in the rest of the country and that's leading to even stronger jobs in other uh, in other sectors when each of those states so it's still very much a forecast you have to dig into the data aggregate data no don't show it um, but I do think over time uh, it, it will start to show. But that's what makes it so exciting for me. It's not like the dot-com bubble in the late 1990s, something that could start quick and end just as quickly. It takes time to build out manufacturing, time to build out um, energy, and then the schools and the homes associated with those new, with those new industries. I like slow to moderate. Right. One of your themes, looking at, at how the market is responding to these fundamentals that Nancy's talking about, um, is that inflation? I, I remember that you telling me that inflation is is the uh, is is the new Fed funds rate, right. and that you've become a instead of a Fed watcher, you've become an inflation watcher. So talk about the inflation piece and how significant that is as far as your con very constructive outlook on the U.S. market. Well, the U.S. economy is unlike any other economy. Seventy-two percent of our GDP is consumption. And so when you think about inflation, think of it as a variable tax rate on consumers. Inflation goes up, you have less discretionary income. Inflation goes down, it's the exact opposite. You feel the equivalent of a tax cut. If you pay less to fill your gas tank, you have more money left in your wallet at the end of the day. And so for the economy, that's essentially the transmission mechanism. For the stock market, lower inflation usually translates into higher multiples, which is exactly what we've seen this year. We've seen a big decline in inflation courtesy of all these problems happening elsewhere in the world, the slowdown in China, Abenomics in Japan, and what it's doing is it's helping lift PEs. So the PE this year has carried the stock market. 80% of the return this year has been from the PE. PE's given us almost 200 points on the S&P. So if it wasn't for all these events taking place, and the consequence, this decline in inflation, I think the stock market would be 200 points lower. So, so why is it that inflation translates into higher price earnings multiples? And then we'll talk about this phenomenon of higher price earnings multiples, which is also very different than we've seen in the last decade. Right. Well, that won't, it won't work this way in every economy. Okay. You know, when you think about the economic textbooks, they treat every economy the same way. And the U.S. economy is not your generic textbook economy. It's unusual. There is no other economy like this where consumption is such a dominant share of GDP. So inflation has essentially become the discounting mechanism for, for multiples, if you will. But at the same time, it's interpreted by the stock market as a source of stimulus. And so it doesn't matter where lower inflation comes from. This year, most of it has come courtesy of a downturn in China. And so I would tell you you know, that China's problems is America's opportunity. That's almost the way to think about it. And it's very different from what we've had in the post-2000 world, where China was growing very, very rapidly. Inflation became kind of the big buzzword in the U.S., and multiples compressed for 10-plus years. As all the commodity prices went up, that was a big That's inflation correct. because of China's growth and demand. And we're right. starting to see the unwind of that, and we're starting to see multiples expand. We believe that's going to be a permanent fixture. So we're able to grow our economy right now at a pretty interesting rate, pretty rapid rate, without generating inflation because the rest of the world is slowing, allowing us to keep inflation at bay. So non-inflationary growth in the 90s is what people called Goldilocks. And I'm not telling you 90s is the perfect proxy for what we're living through, but it's the night, night, last time that we had a market led by expanding multiples. It's been a while. So, so you know, why don't earnings matter as much anymore and why do price earnings multiples matter more? I mean, you know, how did this switch happen? Investors over the last decade haven't, you know, haven't had to think about multiples because they were a one-way bet lower. In the last decade, we had earnings going up 
Right. And we had multiples going down. And so the only path to a higher stock market was via higher earnings. So we've all become conditioned to think that earnings is the only thing that matters. And yet this year, that conventional wisdom has failed you. Because if you're looking at earnings, you're going to see a pretty lackluster story. You look at the stock market, it's phenomenal. The S&P's up almost 20%. It's incredible. And in the context of the 90s, you know, there are years where earnings are almost non-existent and the market goes up 25%. You know, now there's a new recipe for the market and it's via multiples. So what, what's changed in the emerging markets and, and why is the U.S. once again, do you think, going to be the, the driver of global growth? So the United States is really the driver and the anchor for global growth. Mm -hmm. Uh, there has been a major structural shift in the BRICS in particular, EMs in general, over the past decade. Right, emerging markets, Emer being EMs in BRICS, Brazil, pardon, pardon and Russia, uh, India. Uh, right, right, right. Uh, emerging, yeah. emerging markets 15 years ago had very high unemployment rates. And they could grow rapidly for a sustained period of time without creating any domestic inflationary pressures. Now they've been growing too rapidly for roughly 15 years now creating internally a tremendous amount of inflationary pressures, highlighted by a collapse in companies' ability to make money in that part of the world because their costs are going up much faster than the revenue can now grow. And these are global companies that, global are, that, companies. Right, that, that are not able to make that much money anymore in emerging markets. U.S. multinational companies who have spent the past 15 years not investing in the United States but investing in China, in India, and in Brazil to take advantage of this to be sure, which was very, very strong growth. Right. But I think that era of, of, of being able to grow rapidly uh, is, is, is over because they've created so much internal inflation. As a result, policymakers in these countries, China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, are now tightening policies. They are raising rates aggressively because long term, most policymakers realize how dangerous rapid inflation in, indeed can, can be. And in order to cool inflation, you have to grow slowly for a long period of time. This is not one quarter or two. Years? years? Years. They have spent years building growth right. too, too, too quickly. And it takes years, as we saw in the United States in the early 1980s, when we had a, well, in the 70s, had a tremendous inflationary problem. It took three years of a severe recession to, cure, to curb inflation in the United States. And so I think you, you are in a new era, not just in the United States on the plus side, but within many of these emerging markets where they've put in place too much inflation that they will be much weaker longer than expected uh, for Francois mentioned five years for the next uh, three three to five years so globally a very very different uh, economic environment one people don't like to talk about but in the investment world we call it decoupling right where the United States is indeed uh, the leader we don't have an inflation issue as Francois has has highlighted we have longer term growth engines energy and manufacturing the the emerging market turmoil is indeed sending many of these large companies that have done business that in in these regions maybe it's not such a good place to book to build business. So the theme is, if you increasingly sell it in the United States, you make it in the United States, so you don't have to deal with that turmoil within these other countries. Higher interest rates, political uh, inter 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 intervention. Yes, our politics ne necessarily aren't 100% business friendly by any stretch, but relative to what you're seeing, say, in China, where they're demanding you cut medical prices, car prices, fuel prices, milk prices, the government is demanding companies. That's extensive negative intervention. We have issues here to be sure, but relative to the rest of the world, it is a pretty good place to do business. One of the major investment themes that we've been covering for our nine years of existence on WealthTrack is the fact that you want to buy these multinationals that have 40, 50, 60 percent of their earnings from emerging markets. So. Forget that, Francois, now this is the, those are not the kind of companies that you want to own, no. and, and what's the substitute? I think the stocks that will surprise folks are going to be the ones that tend to do well in an environment of lower inflation, and that tends to be the consumer stocks, which have shocked people in the last year, and I think will probably continue to do so. Now, not just cyclically, but structurally. I think uh, the world's problems is the U.S. consumer's uh, opportunity. You know, and that was the 90s, if you remember the Asian crisis, the Russian default, you know, those were horrible crises on the ground, but there was always a silver lining for the U.S. consumer in the form of lower inflation, oh, of lower right. commodity prices. 
And so we're, we're, we're seeing a very similar dynamic uh, today taking place. Now, also, in a world where multiples compressed for 10 years and earnings expanded, where returns were flat, income became very, very important. Dividend has become the buzzword on the street. Everybody wants to have a dividend fund in right. their portfolio. The other theme has been just the search for yield, and so dividend-paying stocks have, until this year, have done extremely well. Exactly. Right. And But if you think back to the 90s, you never heard the word dividend. In a world of expanding multiples, dividends contributed very little to your return, as they have this year. This year, they explain about 10% of the S&P's return. Very, very different from the last few years. So a lot of things are going to start to, to change. But I think the big surprise, you know, the bookends of a portfolio, if you will, in my opinion, you know, should be flipped around. The energy, materials, industrial stocks that did so well for so long, I think are going to start to be the laggards. The inflation, disinflation beneficiaries, if you will, like the consumer discretionary names, the regional banks, things like that, I think are going to surprise people for a very long time. So, so, so should the focus now be on, on domestic revenues and profits? that companies that are actually get the bulk of their, you know, their financial, their business here in, with the U.S. consumer, is, yeah. is that and, basically and that a shift that you would... And that characteristic has worked really, really well this year, and I think that's how people should think about the world. Now, it's a completely different world completely than the one we've lived in, you know, when you think about years, right. all the major regions around the world, the U.S., Europe, Japan, China, we all have structural issues, but the U.S. is the one that has a path out of them. You know, we're, we, we've cut our deficit in half in the last two years. We're about to normalize monetary policy. We've come a long way on consumer deleveraging. We have a way out of these structural issues at a time when Europe hasn't figured one out, where Japan doesn't have one, in my opinion, and where China, you know, China is like Japan in 1990. It has exhausted an economic model that worked so well for so long, which was investments, but investments are now almost half of China's GDP they need to diversify. Are, are you worried about an Asian crisis, another uh, financial crisis in Asia? I mean, I mean, should should we be basically uh, avoiding the emerging emerging markets? I would tread like very the lightly. Plague. Mm -hmm. I would tread very lightly uh, in investing uh, within companies that do a lot of business in the emerging markets right. and or and or direct investments. Indonesian bond yields, for example, over the, everyone's been worried about U.S. bond yields, and to be sure, we've gone up. Uh, to 3%. In Indonesian bond yeah, yields have gone, gone from 5% basically to 9% wow. in, six, in six months. Talk about losing, right. Reflecting your principle. inflationary pressures. Right. The Indian stock market, if you look at the headline Sensex Indian stock market, it's down about 10 to 15%. But if you look at their small and mid cap stocks, they're down 30 to 50%. Inflation is an egregious problem in these countries. Interest rates have to go up. For a sustained period of time, growth has to slow for a sustained period of time in order to uh, get rid of the inflation. So yes, I would definitely be very cautious in investing within the emerging, emerging market. So, so one, one of my favorite headlines from a Cornerstone Macro report uh, was that the, that the, the middle America is, is now my favorite emerging market. Nancy, so can you just explain uh, what you mean by that? 15, 20 years ago, the investment community would fly over to China and India, Brazil, to learn more about those economies, to see what investment opportunities uh, they would have with this outlook for a very strong uh, growth prospect. Now I think you have to do just the opposite. You need to travel to middle America to see how the building of manufacturing plant or the expansion of uh, the energy industry are creating new economies. I visited North Dakota earlier this year, Bismarck, North Dakota. I didn't go up into the actual energy area, but to Bismarck. And indeed, you see it. They're so excited that they're building schools now in Bismarck, three new schools, because people are actually they, people used to commute up to uh, uh, North Dakota and work in the fields. Now they are actually uh, living in North mm -hmm. Dakota. Is, is the cold in North Dakota much different than the heat down in Houston uh, in the summertime? I mean, you can, you, can right, adjust. Right. you can adjust to the different temperatures. So within the United States, North Dakota grew 13 percent, or maybe even 14 percent, uh, their economy expanded by 13, 14 percent in 2012. And this is because of energy, of course. It's because they, of right. energy, but it's the building not only of energy, it's the multiplier. It's the houses right. they're now building or the, or the hotels that they built. And now they're building schools. Those, that, those are characteristics of an emerging right market. market. 
and it's going to be great uh, for job prospects in this country. You don't have to get an MBA and move to New York and work on Wall Street anymore. You can Thank heavens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the appeal of emerging markets typically over time is something that is low cost, usually wages and right. production costs. What the low cost of natural gas is doing in the U.S. is giving us a competitive edge on everyone around the world. And I think when Nancy talks about multiplier effect, that's also what you're referring to, is the right. fact that businesses that weren't viable in the U.S. are becoming viable because of the low cost of energy. And, and it's a domestic source of energy. And given the international right. turmoil, it's, we're, we're unique as a developed country that has a domestic source of energy. Utility prices used to follow fuel oil. Now utility prices follow the price of natural gas, which is obviously very low. Japan does not have any natural source of energy. It's very sad, actually. And given the problems they're currently having up in Fukushima uh, with the uh, leaking of the radioactive right. uh, water, odds are they're not going to be able to turn on any of their nukes uh, in the near future. Germany is, is, is banning uh, their only natural source, which was also nukes. And so at the end of the day, uh, we sit in a very, this energy renaissance, it puts the United States at a very, very different position than any other, not only EM, but any other developed economy, except for maybe right. Canada. So, you know, how do I invest in this new middle America emerging market that Nancy's talking about? What's your strategy there? Well, there's, I mean, there's a lot of different ways uh, to do it. Right. Um, you know, from, as, as you mentioned earlier, when you pick stocks, instead of using dividend as your sole criteria, right. start to look at percentage of revenues derived domestically. Right. And you're going to find opportunities everywhere. You know, even in the industrial sector, which people generally believe is, is, you know, completely driven by the rest of the world and the emerging markets in particular, if you look in the broader indices and you're willing to look at the small caps, you're going to find 96 stocks in the industrial sector of the S&P 1500 that generate more than 80% of their revenues domestically. So there's plenty of opportunities. Um, so I think over the next, you know, three to five years, domesticity, if you will, is going to pay off big for investors. New investment theme. So uh, speaking of specific investments, one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, what would you have all of us own some of, Nancy? I would just uh, continue what Francois right. mentioned. U.S.-based industrial companies, not only from potentially domestic, stronger domestic revenue growth, but also the potential for mergers, amongst them and or international investment, which is just starting to happen. So I think internationally you're going to see some of these larger industrial companies see this opportunity in the United States, very similar to what happened in the emerging, in the emerging world over the past 15 years. But instead of buying companies in uh, China or India, they increasingly buy companies, the small mid-cap stocks that Francois mentioned, in the, in the, in the United States. Is and there so, a vehicle that, that, that you've identified? As of now, no, uh, I, I, other than Francois' screen uh, that lists uh, right. 96 companies that get 75, 80 percent more of their revenue domestically. Sounds like a good place to start for, right. for me. Your one investment? I would say take it a step further, you know, believe in the U.S. consumer. I think the retail stocks are going to be, they have been, and are going to continue to be the big surprise. If you look at how retail performs as a group, as a sector, it's basically the same thing as U.S. inflation trends. And so if you believe this story, this structural story of inflation that remains low and contained, um, I think what you want to go for is a retail-based ETFs, and there's plenty to choose from, um, you know, in that group. All right, terrific. Thank you so much for joining us for a WealthTrack exclusive. The two of you together for the first time as co-founders of Cornerstone Macro. So Nancy Lazar, Francois Trahan, lovely to have you here on WealthTrack. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. At the end of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's Action Point follows the example of Nancy Lazar, Francois Trahan, and their colleagues at their new firm, Cornerstone Macro. It is don't be afraid to invest in yourself. Now, we talk about outside financial investments every week on wealth track, but the best investment you can make is a personal one, maximizing your own productivity, creativity, and happiness. Lazar Trahan and their fellow co-founders gave up top-level positions at outstanding firms to focus on their first professional love, pure macro research in economics, policy, and strategy with people they admire, respect, and like. 
Without realizing it, they followed the counsel of my former college professor, world-renowned mythologist Joseph Campbell, who told all of his students to follow your bliss. It is the best single piece of advice I have ever received. And next week's guest has done exactly that as well. Fixed income star Kathleen Gaffney recently left her longtime high profile position at Loomis Sales to start her own bond fund at Eaton Vance. Is this any time to launch a bond fund? She'll explain why it is for her. If you missed any of our past WealthTrack interviews, you can find them on our website, WealthTrack.com. We also have additional conversations of a more personal nature exclusively in WealthTrack Extra, as well as proprietary research from our many sources. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Luma Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. And Rosalind P. Walter.